It is time. Welcome to today's webinar, Deploy Once, Develop Omni, brought to you by CCW Digital and Spitch. I'm Brian Cantor, Principal Analyst for CCW and your host for today's discussion. If I were to ask you to name two topics that have dominated the customer contact landscape for the past decade, you'd likely answer omni-channel engagement and the rise of AI. Unfortunately, if I were to ask you to name two areas that have created significant challenges for the customer contact community, you'd probably give me the same answers. For all the talk and all the hype and investment into both topic areas, many continue to struggle to achieve success. Our research shows that less than 20% of companies even self-report omni-channel capabilities. And that explains why so many customers face long wait times and can't find the right touch point and then have to repeat the same information when they finally do get to the right touch point. And so that explains why results have not been great for Omnichannel. And the same is true for AI with, we've seen dismal results there explaining why customer self-service and agent productivity are not where they need to be, even as the customers and the business community embrace technology to an extent they never have previously. Today, we're going to address these gaps by taking an important approach, looking at them in tandem. The reality is that a modern intelligent virtual assistant will not only elevate automated interactions, but empower your business to create a more seamlessly connected experience wherever, whenever, why ever the customer chooses to connect. One that is actually omni-channel, not just multi-channel with a false label. To get us there, we're going to have a multi-part discussion. We're going to hear from an industry expert, then walk through a case study reflecting a tremendously successful example of where AI can make an impact throughout the omni-channel journey. We'll then get a first-hand look at cutting-edge technology that is supporting this transformation before closing with a Q&A with all of our panelists about the state of AI and the state of omni-channel and opportunities to elevate customer centricity. And as a reminder, this session is being recorded and you can submit your own questions if you don't like the ones I'm asking at any time using the console on your screen. Anything we don't get through, we'll make sure to pass over to our speakers to follow up via email. Without further ado, I wanna take a chance to get to know our three panelists for today. So first we have Gary, who's the Director of Sales and Consultancy with Spitch. Gary's leveraged his background in electronics and IT to move into a senior commercial role in the voice solution space. And he's found particularly groundbreaking success in the continuous speech recognition realm. So, Gary, how is everything? Uh, it's great. Thank you, Brian. And thanks for the introduction and for hosting us here today. I'm really excited to be telling you a bit of our technology uh, and hopefully giving you a realistic view of what's happening in the market today. You know, it isn't all a bed of roses, as you've already alluded to but hopefully we can show people that there is a path to getting the very best out of AI in the, in the market today. And I think you hit on such an important point there, right? Because it's not that the technology doesn't exist to solve the problems I addressed. Instead, the tragic thing is it very much does exist, but you have to find the right technology and more importantly, back it with the right mindset. And I know that that combination is important to all three members of our panel and certainly a path that we're gonna be discussing a lot today. Now, we also have Joe here, who is uh, the design and development director for Dialog Composer and has 15 years of experience in the technology space. Primarily, his focus has always been on real world applications. So again, not just looking at technology because it's cool or it has great features, but because it can make a real impact. And so prior to, be to starting with Spitch and really taking a huge role in this groundbreaking organization, he also had a research scientist background at Yandex. So, so Joe, I want to give you a chance to add anything about yourself and your passion for the topic as well. Sure. Well, like you said, Brian, thanks, thanks again for the introduction. Um, I've been working in natural language processing, contact center at automation for, for about 15 years. And my background is in automatic speech recognition, um, initially as a research scientist. Now I'm, I'm a lot more focused on the, the customer facing aspects of, of, um, of that topic. And I'm really excited today to talk with you guys about the technology aspects of um, all the topics that, that Gary uh, started getting into. And that's key too, because for as much as I said, sometimes we're not finding the right technology, 
what sometimes happens is that we're not looking at technology through the right lens. We just know it as the buzzwords. We know it as kind of the end result that we're looking for. And we don't think about the nuances and the mechanic mechanisms that are required to take an idea or a goal and make it a reality. And having someone with your background that really looking at that technology is going to be so useful for our discussion today. Finally, want to end with want to end by introducing Greg, who will actually be our first person to kick off the discussion today. Now, when you talk about the idea of an expert or an influencer in this space, if you will, it can be a very hollow term, right? It's basically just something. It's a title you can give yourself, but not Greg, because he has this embodiment of a credible expertise. He has, before kind of advising the industry and giving his perspective, he had a legitimate background in leading successful CX transformation projects. From there, he then went to advise our community through the CX Goalkeeper podcast and involvement in numerous international events, as well as his bestseller, Customer Experience 3. He's also one of the few CCXPs in Switzerland, and I believe the only ACXS Plus certified person here. So certainly a lot of great credibility there. Greg, how's everything going? Thank you very much, Brian. It's great to be here and to have such a great discussion with this, this panel. I am really thrilled to have a nice discussion with you. And as you said, I think we are speaking about technology. Technology is what we need and we want to leverage in order to create outstanding ex experiences. These experiences are the key differentiator for our businesses, independent from which industry we are working. And in the, these experiences are really personal. And it means it's specific to you, Brian, specific to Gary, how you are feeling about these experiences. And we can, and I love to discuss about this technology to make these experiences stand out. Absolutely. So, so Greg, again, I want to just give you a chance here to preface what your sense of the importance of this topic and really where we need to be focusing. Because like I said, we there's no shortage of talk here, right? There's no shortage of... AI is important. There's no shortage of conversational AI is essential for the contact center. And of course, there's no shortage of discussion about omni-channel. I remember my very first CCW event that I went to back in 2011, and omni-channel was the topic back then. And now we're looking 10 years later at a time when digital communications only become more mature. It's only become more embedded in our customers' lives. And yet, you can argue that we haven't made meaningful improvements in terms of actually delivering an omni-channel experience. So to set up our discussion, any thoughts on where we need to be looking, what you're seeing, and what, how we can start getting ourselves on the right track? Sure, thank you very much, Brian. And also to the audience, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity and to share my ideas, my view on this topic. Let's, let's really start with voice. Voice is with the medium that we are using to speak is the easiest way to communicate. And if you think about voice, historical is the most used medium because we are calling, uh, calling a company. Nowadays, only the phone using this phone solution, it's not enough. Even if we think about, um, I was reading the, uh, the 2020, 2021 achieve, uh, Achieving Customer Amazement study from Shep Icon, one thought leader in, uh, in customer experience and in customer service. And also in 2021, the most used, the preferred channel to communicate with, to interact with the, with the company is phone, is calling the customer. And basically, let's leverage this information and making two examples or taking two completely different examples. I am following Gary Vaynerchuk. I think he doesn't need any introduction. He is always in every speech, if somebody is asking about the future, what's, what's next, is always speaking about this voice solution. And think about saying, a Siri or Alexa or all these solutions that are in the play are in the place, and you ask to this uh, to this uh, interface, I need I need a new pair of shoes. You are not saying which brand. You are not saying how, how big they should be because they know you, and therefore they can offer this solution. Thinking about service, if you say to these uh, this in these solutions, I I forgot the the login to this and that uh, and that web email address or something like that. These are the solutions that will simplify our life, automating interactions, automating experiences that need really to help us and can help us. And take another, so another example, the easiest one. My son, four years old, is able to interact with these solutions, but is not able to open an app and click here and click there or to unlock something. And therefore, 
the new generation is growing with this solution. It's not like me or older people that think about, oh, but uh, early days it was easier. Nowadays, small children, four years old, are able to interact with such solution. And therefore, I think this is the key, starting from that and elaborating on what you are saying, Brian. Now we're speaking about omnichannel, having only a voice interface, it's your mobile phone, it's Alexa, it's Siri, or it's the phone, it's not enough. Customer expect to feel the same experience when they are interacting with the company through all the different channels of choice. And basically, if I'm connecting and co or contacting with a company, through the phone, I expect exactly the same experience if I'm contacting them via email, via chat, via social media. And therefore, it's really important to have one platform in place that it's able to handle all these interactions. And this is extremely important. Develop once and deploy Omni for all the channels to offer the same experience to our customers. And if we think about this solution, what are the advantages that we are seeing on the market? First of all, customer satisfaction. If I can interact with the company through all these different channels and there is a machine, there is something supporting me as a customer, but also the business, for example, uh, connecting you with the next best agent, meaning the agent that is able to handle your request or with a virtual assistant that is able to prepare the discussion with, the with, uh, with, uh, with an agent. This is key and create customer satisfaction. For the employees, it's help also because they are not always required to end in boring interactions to, uh, to repeat always the same. This is something that a machine can do. We should leverage the human beings for this more difficult task where they can create value for the customer. And then at the end, mentioning value and efficiency, because if we need to handle a smaller number of interactions, if we need to um, handle a smaller number of cases because the others are performed by, by the machine, then sorry, I think it's, it's clear. We have a clear return on investment. Leveraging this solution to enable, to empower employees to focus on relevant interaction where they can create value for the company and for the customer are the future. And it's extremely key to leverage such solution because then you can also get proactive. The, the biggest question that I always have, um, my credit card is not working because it was blocked. Why, why, what the hell? Why the company, the issuer is not telling me, we blocked your card, please pay your bill or please uh, type the right uh, personal identification number. This is key. Now we have the data and we have the solution in order to enable and perform such, such transactions. And I think also together with speech, thinking about, discussing about this solution, it, it's, it's clear that it stands out. Um, it's clear I worked personally together with, with speech and I had really a great experience with them because it's a collaboration. It's we defined what we want to achieve. We worked together. We created a roadmap. We created a vision. It's not only one project that you deploy today and then you stop and you do, go to the next one. It's the transformation. It's linked to technology. It's linked also to cultural, to a cultural aspect. And therefore, it's extremely important to collaborate and then to work together with the customer to create new solution because customer expectations are changing. We are developing our business is developing and new solution, new solution are, are there. And therefore it's important to work together with the customer to create these experiences that I was, was mentioning at the beginning. And therefore, again, extremely important having such solution to quickly change, make some tweaks, uh, tweaks to, to the solution and improve the efficiency creating value for businesses and for customer. And again, this is a great solution to have low code or no code solution in place in order to offer these experiences to our, to our customers. And please don't forget, this is the only way that we have nowadays to differentiate ourselves as a business from the others. Well, so many phenomenal bits of wisdom right there. I think first and foremost, by talking about the enduring role of voice, you hit on something that's important, that it wasn't, people were not objecting to voice or they weren't even objecting to the phone per se. They're objecting to experiences that are inefficient and impersonal. And when you start to understand how to make the experience smoother, 
how to make it personally tailored, not only to their information, but what they're looking for at a given moment, what information they need, what they don't need, and zeroing in on that, that's when you create a better experience. And when you can start to look across your journey, see how the combination of data you're collecting, the combination of technology offerings you have, and the combination of human expertise as well as AI can come together to deliver the optimized experience based on customer intent, based on urgency, based on customer need, wherever it's happening, that's when you're gonna be delivering a great experience. And for as much as what you said sounds idealistic the most important thing is that it's so realistic right now because of advances we have seen in technology and and gary i want to turn it over to you at this point to walk through how you've made this work for organizations the success they've seen and really prove that we're not just talking about theory we're talking about reality right now with pleasure brian and uh thank you for the introduction and greg thank you for that great talk and for joining us today i know you're a busy man so thanks for finding that time so I'm just um, going to share my screen now, if I may. Um, so just a few, couple of seconds delay. OK, can you see that? OK. Presumably you can all see that. Um, so anyway, just before I get into my piece, I just want to remind everybody uh, that we're giving away training and certification today on our conversational AI development platform. Uh, and this is just basically a thank you for attending, for finding the time to be with us today. This training will be done remotely, obviously, in these times. It's gonna be spread over several weeks, a couple of hours per week, so it won't impact your, your calendars. We'll make available a sandbox facility for your practical work. Um, and you're free as attendees today to enroll with us, give us your details after this. Um, and we don't mind if you do that as individuals or if it's more suitable, nominate um, another individual from your organization to take your place. Uh, we don't mind either way. The main thing is we urge you to um, take full advantage of what we think is a great uh, giveaway today. Okay, so I'm now gonna introduce you uh, to the subject, which is our case study uh, for today's um, webinar. Okay, so this is a, um, a global giant in electronics. Unfortunately, we're not quite ready um, to, uh, to, to give the name at the moment, but they're a major, major household name in consumer electronics. And we're gonna be making a formal news announcement all about this in the coming weeks. So this presentation is gonna be about the implementation of our Intelligent Virtual Assistant or IVA, as I'll refer to it in parts for this client. And I want to stress from the outset that this is a true omni-channel solution. And I'm stressing the word true because we feel uh, that this is real second generation and that the market has been a little bit misled for many years by solutions purporting to be omnichannel, but without the real characteristics that distinguish them from, shall we say, older style, just multi-channel um, or first generation uh, predecessor solutions. So this is not going to be pretty. We're not gonna dress this up. In fact, we're gonna tell you what's not working out there. We're even gonna show you uh, shortcomings of using this technology, but hopefully we'll show you how you can get the very best um, of AI in the market today. So first of all, uh, just a little bit about the background. Now in this picture, hopefully this will chime with many similarities with your own customer service operations. And the picture in fact would apply to any sector, you know, not, not just in this case, consumer electronics, you know, the problems in the call center are, are, are pretty uh, common. In our own subject case, um, the operations grown over the years as the company's grown, it's got more complex. And with every new fun function that the managers have naturally taken on, um, costs have risen as well. But with those costs uh, have the pressures on the faculty as the organization has placed higher focus on customer experience, as they've taken on needs to drive other aspects such as sales, such as tech support, even add-on services like marketing campaigns. And along with this complexity um, and increasing cost, you've also had that ever-increasing drive for efficiency 
gain and to drive down those same costs. So it's a vicious circle that many of you are going to be all too familiar with, I'm sure. Um, so what are the pain points in, for this particular client? So um, high cost of operations, uh, and these have been worsened by the challenges due to COVID. So for example, already high costs have been increased uh, through the need to provide all the additional um, function and infrastructure for what is essentially um, a home-based uh, work workforce over the last couple of years. And existing problems that they had, such as um, slow processing of calls and routing of customer calls, has been made worse. Additionally, authentication, which is a slow process in the best of times, to give you an idea, we did a survey and it came out at something like between three and five minutes just to authenticate using traditional means. And this has always been problematic uh, and in fact painful for the customer and the agent. And when we add on top of that a lack of any real analytic solution, this has meant that they've had to rely on anecdotal information, you know, from uh, management reports, from CRM, static information, um, and also from agent notes. So it hasn't given great insight, you know, considering the huge volume of interactions that they uh, continually experience. And talking about experience, what, what were the... Um, you know, the, the, the previous experiences with this type of technology. So um, they have had some limited exposure to AI technology in their own infrastructure. Uh, for example, some basic website automation, such as um, intelligent drop-down menus, um, a kind of visual IVR, uh, in other words, um, altogether not providing much payback really or benefit for the operation uh, and a lot of web page navigation for the for the customers um, however they've done a lot of research into the available AI solutions in the market uh, and come up with a few conclusions um, and one was that um, solutions are largely overpriced and probably oversold into the market and that the pricing models that accompany them are inflexible at best and at worst actually unworkable uh, with the upshot meaning that um, billing becomes impossible to predict or even plan for. Also vendors tend to charge extortionate amounts um, down track you know for doing very minor enhancements uh, and development changes uh, which probably a lot of you will already be familiar with unfortunately. So what were their initial goals uh, in, a, in the ideal um, AI solution? So first of all, um, these are all things that are going to give them the service improvements that they're looking for. So they wanted to relieve the pressure on the call centre uh, by providing more self-service possibilities for the customers. They wanted a faster way to authenticate customers on calls, something that had always been a bugbear to customers and agents alike. And naturally, they were looking to, to reduce costs along uh, the way. So a convincing ROI was also sought. And they wanted to be able to classify the reasons for the customer calls, do that automatically and steer them also automatically to the correct agents quickly and every time. Last but not least, um, of course, they wanted to improve um, CX. So they had quite a shopping list of improvements, but I think you'll agree a reasonable improvements given, given their pain points. So what they did was they did a trawl um, of the marketplace. And uh, I did warn you, you know, we're not going to pretty this up. These are the things that they found uh, from some of the vendors out there, surprisingly, some of the larger vendors as well. Um, and you won't be surprised to find that high pricing and over complex price models and inflexible pricing was something that they found uh, commonly uh, amongst potential suppliers, um, confirming their earlier experiences, I must say. Um, and many of the vendors claimed actually to be providing cutting edge omnichannel. Uh, but when their team actually uh, did a discovery on this and uh, delved a bit deeper, they find that some of them, many of them, 
didn't have uh, you know a, a, a clear um, single platform solution uh, but in fact there were incohesive elements you know to, to a certain degree um, and some of them the worst ones were a mixture of actually third party technologies which at best would give multi-channel in other words several channels but but operating independently and without that synchronization uh, which we, I'll, I'll tell you more about as this uh, session develops some were also very vague and perhaps deliberately so uh, on the thorny subject of professional services costs such as for future enhancements for language model tuning training of staff and so on and these let me tell you are standard things and there should be very agreed fixed pricing for all this sort of thing because they're all necessary necessary ingredients you know for a good uh, ai solution and also commonplace was the lack of any provision of high level easy to use development tools that could be used by the customers in house team and along with that the training so all that good stuff and finally and happily, this only applied to a small minority of vendors that they spoke to. Uh, they were very poorly presented in terms of the sales and technical um, presentations and professionalism. But anyway, that's enough of the negative side. We're now going to look at the, the nice things that they were looking for, the ideals um, out there that did exist amongst many vendors. So um, flexibility on price, um, you know, um, it's important that you work uh, with the customer. If, if, you know, this really is for any vendors that are in our audience today and welcome, you know, we all need to make these improvements to make the market great for us all, you know, as much as we all compete with one another. So flexibility is absolutely fundamental, you know, and sometimes the larger the organization, we do understand the reasons why they, they want to be um, uh, uh, less flexible, in fact. And something that goes with that is to provide 100% flexibility on where the system is going to be cited. So whether you host it for the customer, whether they host it in their cloud, or even if it goes into their own infrastructure on premise. And with that, the licensing options shouldn't be limited. And I'll give you an example. Let's suppose they want to cite this on premise because some of the data is sensitive. This is becoming a very common thing. Um, you should not stop them being able to access a SaaS license, even though everything's on premise. Another thing that, the, that they wanted, an ideal uh, criteria for success, the solution should be delivered from a central platform, ideally from one core technology stack um, so that existing channels can be completely synchronized together um, and new channels can easily be turned on and then on top of that ps costs should be agreed and fixed up front um, at the very least to cover up to and including uh, production also the availability of high level tools with the ability for low level support in other words with apis must be available along with all the training if needed and there must be ultimately a low code no code capability for those customers who do not have coding or expert teams but still wish to make minor changes to the system okay so now let's turn to the scope of the project and you'll see that the first two elements, the actual uh, design of the voice driven IVR, including voice biometrics, they're pretty much in line with uh, what the initial goals were. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about what they wanted that uh, IVR to do. So the intelligent virtual assistant would do this job, initially set to task on the voice channel. Um, and it would answer customer calls and then using NLU, NLP based AI, understand the customer intent. In other words, what was the reason that they were calling? Then classify the call automatically and then route that call correctly to the skilled agent or agent group. Secondly, voice biometrics would be used for rapid authentication of the customer so we didn't have to go back to this old style what you might call 20 questions which leads to very long drawn out calls and frustration on the side of both the caller and the agent because nobody in this day and age can remember all the answers to all the secret questions and the big takeaway from the scope of this project is that 
analytics were to be used, conversational analytics uh, in the first part of the project in the discovery phase so that they could fully explore and comprehend all the different kinds of customer interactions that were taking place and thereby identify any additional customer intents and entities. In other words, by intents and entities, we mean the names of concepts, the names of products, the names of services, and the jargon that goes with it, of course, and the way the phraseology, the way that people want to talk, because this is all about using natural voice, saying it as you want to say it, not having to have certain phrases. So this provides a dynamic information source as opposed to the traditional way of scoping the project, where in the discovery phase, you look at sometimes old data from the CRM or anecdotal information from management, etc. OK, so what were some of the challenges? So again, not prettying this up, let's, let's look at what the, the obstacles were. So first of all, let's look at communication. You know, we very often don't talk about this. We talk about technology as the answer, but actually when it boils down to it, it's how two groups of humans are actually going to interact well. And something very fundamental in the world of AI is that the two teams up front should really agree on a glossary of terminology at the start of the project so that there's always clear and unambiguous dialogue throughout the life cycle of the project and beyond. And what this does is it gets over the differences of terminology that exist across what is a very global and diverse world of AI. Something else that's important to mention is that paperwork itself can slow down and, and sometimes grind to a halt, especially in a large organization where there are many different nodes in the paper trail. So it's important to try um, your best right up front to identify potential pinch points and mitigate for them in the project plan. Something else that I have to mention as well um, is a scope creep, as it's sometimes referred to, and it's when you get the um, requirement spec widening at the beginning of the project. And, you know, for example, this can happen through the use of analytics because you go back to the drawing board, you widen the specification for the IVA. Um, but many of the resulting um, tasks that come from this can actually be uh, managed in parallel by the technical teams, uh, thereby uh, absorbing a lot of the delays that might be caused. So let's now examine the good stuff, the outcomes from the project. So obviously, uh, reduction um, in agent time uh, leads directly to reduced cost. So reduction in agent time is coming from several places, from quick authentication of customers, from being able to classify calls automatically, uh, route them uh, through to the correct agents, etc. All this is saving huge amounts of agent time uh, and thereby cost saving. Also, the same analytics tool that's been used in the discovery phase can still be used down track. We can even share licensing um, with this because we're using batch analysis of the calls. Um, and it can be used um, on an ongoing basis, not only to make improvements to the IVA downstream, but also provide um, valuable customer insights into the organization, not just into the call center, but all the other aspects in the organization. And of course, CX is being improved uh, no end because we don't get call cues. It's a very important thing to stress here when a, a voice bot, as we sometimes call them, um, answers a call it happens uh, instantly. There's no 20 minute call cues. Uh, and because the call can be identified and classified and the call are routed, there's no hanging around. I mean, this is a fantastic thing for the customer. I think everyone on this call will agree. And just one more point about analytics, continued use of analytics um, into the future post-production um, also helps to identify potential areas for future developments, future enhancements. So on that topic, uh, what sort of um, uh, development is now envisaged uh, by the client. Well, as I've alluded to, uh, from this type of technology, new channels um, can easily be developed and added when needed. 
uh, and one example, social media, such as a Facebook channel. And because all the um, solution has already been developed from within one central platform, all the integrations to the back end have been made, the logic has already been developed. The idea of switching in a new channel is a very, very simple process and, and, uh, and, lo and a low cost process as well. Um, um, and it also goes along the line of today's motto. And if everybody just takes away one small thing, I want everyone to remember this, develop once, deploy Omni, because you're going to hear a lot about this in the market. The IVA technology also can be taught new tricks, and this is something else that can happen. Um, for example, it can recognize an upsell situation and even carry out the sale if it's a straightforward one from beginning to end, or alternatively, know when it's time to hand over to an agent for completion. And what's more, the provision of high level tools and training to the customer means that if decided, they can make these changes and enhancements themselves. Another area that an IVA is perfect for handling is FAQs or frequently asked questions, uh, which is something that people attempt to do with their chatbots on websites and most of the time fail, I have to say, such as where can I buy a product? It's just one area. It's very easy to implement and very easy for the IVA to handle and again takes pressure off the call centre. And once again, analytics can be further utilised uh, and um, developed to measure such things as agent performance, best practice in selling and support, as well as assess agent training needs and effectiveness. Okay, so you'd probably be uh, glad to know that this is the, um, the last of the, shall we say, the internet, the uh, uh, presentation uh, content from my, my end, and it's, uh, it's demo time. Yeah, and Gary, I think you did a phenomenal job there. First and foremost, by mapping goals and objectives and challenges that everyone out there can relate to, and then really showing that an organization, a massive global powerhouse, was able to achieve them. But more importantly, showing that it doesn't stop there. Because remember, the goal isn't just, in the long run, a slightly better average handle time or slightly better CSAT score or maybe even slightly happier agents. The goal is a consistently improving customer experience that always gets better. And that last slide really spoke to how by starting with solving core problems using an IVA, but recognizing what it unlocks for you down the road and tapping into that, that's where you're going to be greatly successful. And I think this demo is going to show you, though, that this is not just, again, a, a bunch of concepts, that there was a clear roadmap. And it really, if you use technology correctly, it makes this so obvious why it works and so powerful to see how it all comes together. So Gary, I'm gonna let you kind of share the demo and walk through it, but I think it's gonna be great to help people visualize how attainable a great customer experience really is. Okay, thanks, Brian. So I'm gonna share my screen again, and hopefully you'll see this video now. Okay, can everyone see that? Great. So just a quick word before we start this, uh, you're going to see um, uh, a demo of our intelligent virtual assistant in operation. It's, a, it's answering um, a typical customer service inquiry um, at this client. And um, I said right at the beginning, we weren't going to try and make this pretty. So you're going to see uh, a call and the call is not going to be very successful for the uh, intelligent virtual assistant because it's going to run out of ideas. You're going to see the customer get frustrated. I hope you find this entertaining. Um, but what we're going to see then is how um, once the call has been handed to an agent and completed, we can then use analysis again. We can use analytics to look, to dig into that call and see why the IVA isn't performing as it should. So I'll let the demo speak for itself. Hopefully you'll get the sound as it starts. I'll just um, explain that you're seeing the actual development environment here, what we call our test environment. So obviously the customer wouldn't see Welcome this. Welcome to Consumer Electronics Customer Support. I'm a virtual assistant. You can ask me questions like you would with a human. What can I help you with today? Hello, I have a problem with my recent purchase. Which product do you need help with? My vacuum cleaner. 
better help you. Please tell me the last five digits of the product serial number. For your convenience, you can use your voice or your keypad. I don't know it. Where can I find the serial number? Sorry, I didn't quite get that. Could you please repeat it? I don't know where to find the serial number. Sorry, I didn't quite get that. Could you please repeat it? I don't know the serial number. Sorry, I didn't quite get that. Could you please repeat it? Oh, uh, come on. Can I talk with a human, please? To better help you, please tell me your five-digit order number. Oh, what the hell? I don't know it either. Okay. I'll get you right over to one of our agents who can help with your vacuum cleaner issues. Hello, thanks for calling the Consumer Electronics Customer Care Support Team. My name is Lucine. How may I help you today? Hi, Luzine. My vacuum cleaner is not working anymore, and this stupid machine is asking for the serial number. I don't know where to find it. Oh, I'm really sorry for the inconvenience. The serial number starts with the letter R, and it's uh, 12 digits long. You can find your product serial number above the power outlet of your vacuum cleaner or on the back of the product. Do you find it? Oh, I'm checking. Wait a moment, please. Uh, yes, okay, I have it. Uh, the serial number is R4312958401. Okay, I'm creating a ticket about the problem with your product. Would you like me to send you the link with the address of your local authorized repair center or the label to send your device to a depot facility? And the label, please. And would you prefer to send you the label by email or text? To my email, please. Okay, I'll just send the link to the email you provided when placing your order. Is there anything else I can help you with? Uh, no, thanks. That's all for today. Uh, goodbye. Thanks for your call. Have a nice day. Okay, so I'm just pausing it here just to explain what you've seen. This is what we call um, hitting the brick wall uh, in, uh, in industry speak. So in other words, the IVA has been deployed. It's doing a, a basic job, but it gets into difficulties. Okay, so what we can do here is we can um, deploy analytics um, just to examine the calls. So we're looking at the entire call with the agent and try and uh, determine why more calls are being transferred uh, and look at the language being used as well. What the hell? I don't know it either. Hi, listener. My vacuum cleaner is not working anymore, and this stupid machine is asking for the serial number. I don't know where to find it.
Okay, so at this point, what you're looking at is, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of giving you the idea that, you know, we, we, we digging into all the calls, we're seeing how the frequency of uh, the system not being able to handle particular calls and why. Um, and now we're going to concentrate on how to make improvements to the system to be able to get around that, what was described as a full back mechanism. So what we call out of domain answers. So it's, it's conversation that the IVA can't handle, but we've got a full record of that that we can analyze, of course, through the analytics platform. Uh, and we can enable alternative branches of logic within the IVA, um, as well as the code to be able to handle, uh, you know, the, the, these extensions to that type of interaction. So what you're gonna see now, as second part of the video, is you're gonna see the IVA handling the similar call, but you're also gonna see the omni-channel um, experience in operation, you might say, because the customer's gonna get so far into this call uh, and then they're gonna uh, continue that in a, in a text chat. Why? Because that is, is uh, um, more convenient for the customer at that particular time. So let's carry on with that. Again, you see in the test environment here. Welcome to Consumer Electronics Customer Welcome. Support. Welcome. You can ask me questions like you would with a human. What can I help you with today? Hello, I have a problem with my recent purchase. Which product do you need help with? My vacuum cleaner. To better help you, please tell me the last five digits of the product serial number. For your convenience, you can use your voice or your keypad. I don't know the serial number. Please let me know if you need help with finding the serial number of your vacuum cleaner. Oh, that would be great. The serial number starts with the letter R and is 12 digits long. You can find the serial number of your product in menu, settings, product information, serial number. Please tell me the last five digits of the serial number of your product. Oh, sorry, I'm not in front of the device now. Okay, no worries. In this case, I will register your case and send you a link to our Telegram bot by SMS. Feel free to call back us later today or use the Telegram channel to finish your technical support request as soon as you have the serial number. Is there anything else I can help you with? Uh, no, thanks. Thank you for being a Consumer Electronics customer. Don't forget to refer us to your friends. Have a good day. So note that the customer um, is picking up the thread in the Telegram channel uh, sometime later at their convenience, but they're continuing seamlessly with that interaction and not having to start again. Okay, I'm going to stop it there because what it does then is just load up Google Maps uh, and guides them to the uh, repair center, which is closest to the location. Okay, so you know, just to recap, you saw in the first part of the video how these things can uh, run into problems. Uh, but then we showed you how we use our analytics tool, which is all delivered from the same platform, to analyze the calls, where they're going wrong, and also be able to make the necessary changes very easily, very simply, so that the IVA can pick that up. And then in the second part, 
you saw the whole thing working, but you saw the customer fully in control of that interaction, starting in voice and then picking that up at a later stage at their convenience in a chat panel environment. Okay, so that's, uh, that's it for the demo uh, side, Brian. Yeah, well, what I like about that is it leads perfectly into the first question I have as part of the Q&A, because what you saw there, in my opinion, is the textbook example of the great customer service irony in that we go on these webinars, we have these meetings, we talk about how you want to build your entire experience around the customer. And then when you look at the actual implementations, you make these decisions based on your boardroom, what you as a business think is the right situation. Case in point with that serial number, that's not something that a typical customer probably is going to know where to find or know is necessary, but that's how you've programmed your team to think you have to build support based on the product serial number. And so what happens is you have an IVA that is ineffective. Glad the analytics tool was able to solve that, but let's be honest, not every company is using the right platform that has such an analytics tool. So I want to start, and Gary, you can take the lead here, on any your thoughts on whether you feel that the typical IVA implementation is actually aligned with what customers want to get out of it, as opposed to just being what sounds cool in a sales pitch meeting or looks great in a screen share or something like that? Uh Probably not. Um, uh, well, let, let me just let me just say that in a minority of cases, mm -hmm. uh, for the simple reason that you know we don't have to be research experts. We all in our everyday lives use similar services. Um, I'll give you an example in in chat. Very often, if I try uh, what should be intelligent chat on a website invariably will hit the brick wall and you know you hit the brick wall because at the end of your conversation it'll just say please telephone this number and you know that you're going to go back to square one so there's very little intelligence in that um, I say minority because occasionally we do call somewhere and hit a really great um, uh, IVA I only wish it was ours but there are, there are some out there, really good ones, and you know there's a great team behind it and probably a great team on the vendor side who've implemented it. But the minority, I have to say. And Joe, I know you had some additional thoughts to add as far as the, the evolution of IVA technology and its alignment with customer expectations. Yeah, so I, I also think, you know, if we go back to say the, the 90s when this story kind of started, you were, you were stuck with, you know, just recognizing a few words from a list at best. Um, we had, you know, most virtual assistants that we dealt with in the early 2000s or even up into say the, you know, the first half of the 2010s were, were really pretty limited in terms of their capabilities. And, you know, they'd operate in one channel, that channel would tend to, you know, be unlikely to be integrated with anything else. Um, if other channels were even supported. Um, and the, the speech to text capabilities at the time were also you know, really pretty limited. And this was in the time when I was in graduate school, you know, streaming, spontaneous speech to text, it, it really wasn't a realistic end game. Um, and this meant that a lot of the work that was you know, going into building these kinds of IVRs or nascent IVAs um, focused on guiding the caller or the customer to say you know, one of you know, a couple of specific uh, expected things. And if they veered away from it, you saw something like what you know, Gary just showed us, <laughs> outcomes generally like a predictable disaster. Um, but I think we've come actually a long way in the last five and a half, six years, especially with the, the low level um, technology capabilities. So the speech to text is really starting to work and starting to be impressive even to, um, even to us on a, on, a, on a research level. And it's really starting to deliver on its promises. And I think this has been consistently complemented by improvements in the natural language understanding field and you know, coupled uh, with better multi or even omni-channel interactions like Gary showed us there at the end, today's IVAs, and I, I, wanna, I wanna believe that, that ours is one of those, well, are, are really able to do a lot more than their counterparts could you know, five, six, 10 years ago. So I think we're, we're getting closer and closer to really delivering on that promise. One of the interesting things when you think about fails with intelligent, with bots or IVAs or any sort of automation thing is you sometimes don't always know whether it's because the technology was insufficient or because the customer comes in with a predisposed bias. They know that five years ago they hated dealing with a bot, so they're going to assume that this new bot can't understand them when in fact it can. So Gary, I want to kind of get to your point about how 
you haven't always seen success, but you are seeing it more frequently, sort of what Joe echoed as well. When you're looking at what can be done, what can't be done, are you focusing more on, say, market research or CSAT scores? Or are you looking more at sort of actually evaluating the technology and deciding if from the lens of a customer, this is sufficient or not? Yeah, I mean, it's rather than the market research, we're actually finding this firsthand with our clients because, um, you know, it, it, people are coming to us with really sad stories of how they've invested, you know, years sometimes, certainly huge, eye-wateringly large amounts of money, and sometimes their own reputations in implementing systems that don't work or, or pursuing vendors uh, where they had high hopes, but, uh, you know, um, KPIs that started high ended up miserably low because everyone was having to readjust, you know, uh, re readjust expectations, preserve face, and so agree to drop in KPIs, et cetera. And this is typical of what, what we're finding in the market today. So it's very much first-hand experience, uh, you know, and uh, going back to the case study, that was exactly the story that, that gave us, you know, they, they couldn't believe what we were telling them, that the technology does work, and as you say, Brian, you just got to find the right technology. You know, hopefully it's us. We know there are other young companies like that. But, you know, one of the biggest challenges is actually persuading very large organizations to take a fresh look. And part of the reason is they've been so disappointed. You know, they've been, their ideas have been so damaged, you know, in what you might call first generation technology, persuading them to look at young, and I'm not talking about my years now, <laughs> young, fresh technology is that's our hardest challenge. You know, we've got a compelling story to tell. Yeah. And, and Joe, I want to give you a chance to also speak about this from sort of the back end, the architecture, the technology view, because you may, for instance, see things where you know that the technology could solve this problem, but because of how the business is approaching it strategically or the implementation, it doesn't align. So I'm wondering if you have anything to share about where the technology is and how with perhaps a better view of what the customer is looking for, who they are, or just more of a customer centric mindset, you might be able to make the most of what's out there. I think, thanks, Brian. I think that kind of goes to, to the, the previous point I was making in, in my last response. I think we have reached a point now where the, the low level technology is really getting good enough where we can, if we can get our foot in the door and we can, we can say, you know, we can get a customer to give us the time of day, we can show them what's going on. Um, we now have, you know, high quality speech to text, natural language understanding, in some cases, um, what we call zero, so zero shot solutions, where we can, we can go to the customer on the first day and we can say, look, we have something that, that works pretty well out of the box. We need you to help us, you know, find a couple of keywords, find a couple of, of phrases that'll help us to tune it up. And we can start then already taking a limited variant of that um, in, into production. We, we're not to a point where it's going to work perfectly the way a, you know, a, a trained human agent will, but um, I think we're, we're getting to a point where we really can make more of an impact and be more convincing in the first couple of real world interactions, again, than, than we could um, in, you know, even, even the last, you know, four or five years. Yep. And so I think when I look at, take kind of summarize what you've been saying, look at that example earlier, I think the challenge is that, yes, there absolutely is some IVA technology that is obsolete, that is not right for today's environment. But in other cases, there's technology that very much is current, very much is right, but we have to think about two things. One, is it solving the actual problems that customers have? Two, what enhancements can it allow to get to the real goal, which is a better customer experience? And so I know both of you have some examples of the right approach that will use technology for the right purpose. So Gary, starting with you, how should we be thinking about making technology that's going to work for the digitally savvy customer of 2021 and beyond? I think it's, I think there's no one single answer, but I think you've got to take the elements of what we've been talking today you, you need technology, so you really need technology that's, that that vendor owns, yeah? And I know it's easy for us to say because we do own that technology and it's been designed from the ground up. It's not a whole mishmash of all uh, different elements of third-party technologies. Everything is delivered from the same, what we call stack of technologies, layers, if you like, within that. So what we're doing is utilizing different parts of that stack to deliver a real, a truly omni-channel experience. 
Um, whereas if we look at, um, you know, shall we call it first generation technologies are out there. Um, the problem is in getting them all to work in a synchronous way. That's, that's, that's the challenge that existing customers have. As Joe said, if we can get a foot in the door, then we can show them how we do things. Uh, uh, and as I said earlier, I'm sure that, that you know, we're, we're not alone, but sometimes, you know, we've all got to work together in the, in the market to improve the whole market, you know, to get the market to take a fresh look at this. And then Joe, I know you have some specific points and recommendations you would offer our crowd as well. Yeah, so again, um, kind of piggybacking on Gary's points and, and again, repeating a little bit what we're, what's becoming the, the theme of this webinar. So we're focusing on solution environments at speech where we aim for um, what we're calling a low code, no code uh, revision update. We're, we're not 100% there yet in terms of this like no code concept, but uh, we're really trying to make it so that our, our products, so our, our dialogue composer, our speech analytics, and uh, zero, zero shot uh, approaches are, are, are getting us closer to this. And I think that we're really doing a good job of this today. And I think it's important because it means that we're able to kind of democratize this IVA creation process um, without cheapening the quality of the services that we can roll out. And it means that, you know, people who are, who are closer to the actual uh, callers and customers who are actually, you know, interacting with the customers today uh, can make more meaningful direct contributions to that process. So I think by, by simplifying it, aiming for that zero code, no code, or or low code approach. It's not to it's not to you know minimize the contribution of the programmers or minimize contributions of, of other um, uh, stakeholders in the environment, but rather to empower everybody to make meaningful contributions to the solution so that the customers and the agents benefit. If if uh, I can just add something uh, to that, Joe, we um, as well as this, uh, you know, the the, the 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 trick to it is we've got this low code, no code. But at the same time, providing all the low level support um, right. so that you can customize it to the nth degree. You know, I'm kind of thinking as an analogy, the swimming pool, at one end, we've got the paddling pool where you've got very limited co coding resources. And at the other end, you've got the Olympic diving area where they can go to any degree to actually have a perfect, you know, complete customization into the back ends, it, triggering business rules, whatever you need. And of course, the, the necessary synchronizations with systems in the rest of the organization. So it's a kind of an end to end, if you like, approach to integration and development. Well, speaking of end to end and really looking at it through a singular view, Omnichannel was sort of, we talked about that heavily in the beginning of the discussion. It's come up throughout our talk here. And even if you go back to the video, there was an example of multiple channels at play, right? We had the voice bot, but then you also had the SMS text. You had the pass to the live agent. You even had the Google Maps tie-in, you know, at a certain point. So you saw a lot of different channels at play. And of course, we want to make sure that we're approaching those different channels in the way that's going to be most effective for the customer. So Gary, from your perspective, I know this question comes up a lot, but I want to give you a chance to weigh in on omni-channel versus multi-channel, what we need to be striving for and why one is superior to the other. So um, it's very simple, really, Brian. You know, multi-channel um, really means you've got several channels of access, but the key is, are they all synchronized together? You know, as a customer, do you get the feeling that one channel has some strange, spooky knowledge of what's going on on the other channel? Because that's what the omni-channel experience gives you. I can make a call using voice um, and I can break off during that interaction, providing the system got my identity and it got the reason for the call. I can break off and come back at any time I want, either on voice or whatever channels are made available. And so the, the, um, the CX level can be the same whatever channel the, the customer's using and however man, many channels they choose uh, for that complete interaction. And really that's it in a nutshell. And also want to get another technology component, also a buzzword area, which is the role of analytics. So you close your video demo by sharing a great example of how, yes, the bot didn't get it right the first time, but it opened the door to so much data. Now, as we look at this ability to understand so many more interactions across different 
different channels. One, what do we need to be looking at from a technology standpoint to make the most of our potential analytics? But two, what are we prioritizing? You know, what is our ultimate goal when we dive deep into these interactions so that we're actually going to be able to show something for our investments for our time? And Gary, I don't know if you want to start with that one yet. Oh, well, I was going to say, Joe, do you want to answer that one? Because there's a few technology touch points in there about what you've been, you know, driving, because obviously, you know, you're, you're overseeing a lot of the development of our technology. Do you want to just answer that one? Sure. I mean, I could, I could start here with um, another touch point on this um, electronic supplier we've been discussing. So we can talk a little bit about how we use the solution there, maybe. Um, there we've taken a kind of hybrid approach to the rollout. We do this a lot in, in, um, in many customer cases. So we start with information that's shared by the client, you know, forums, FAQs, Q&A sites. And, uh, you know, maybe if it's a, depending on the call center, if there are any skill groups that are already active there, then we use that information together with our, our zero shot intent classifier, which requires, you know, usually very little data to, um, to fine tune, or in some case, none to train some kind of trial model. We roll it out, we try to bootstrap kind of early production and collect real world spontaneous queries as soon as possible. It's similar to you know, what we saw in, in the demo video. Um, then the real caller queries are indexed in the solution like we saw, and we use that, to, that index to review and revise all of the existing groups that we find there. Um, and what we're typically looking for are, are insights that aren't obvious to call center agents who are maybe dealing with these calls day to day independently. We're looking for overarching um, patterns in the call data, and we're looking often um, in, in, in many cases for uh, new groups or topics of performing discovery of information that hasn't um, already been identified by, say, the, the business or by um, the people-centric analytics that already exist. We want to complement that by um, using the data that we have to discover new information that uh, isn't already present. Um, so in this case, we're able to uh, perform a quick analysis, quickly determine if we need to, say, revise or fine-tune the model that we've already deployed into this customer space. Um, and if we do need to, we can perform a quick fine tuning and update. And if not, if all stakeholders are already satisfied with the solution that, that's been deployed, and we can see this in the results that are presented in the analytics um, dashboard ourselves, then we can simply continue with the, um, with the current state of the application. Uh, I don't know if that answers your, your question there um, perfectly, but, but um, uh, feel free to, to follow up there, Gary, if you have further. All I, would, all I would say is just purely from the business side, uh, the other thing is then you've got this opening up if we look at the post-production. So in other words, continued use of the analytics um, platform you know, for more wider use. You've got all very interesting possibilities starting to open up. Uh, different organize, you know, sub components of the organization, like in marketing, like in sales, even uh, as I, I, I touched on, um, you know, for training analysis, because training is a huge uh, overhead. It's a real burden in a call center because you have to take um, agents away from their desk uh, and, and they're manda mandated to do this for, you know, so many training days per year. But with the analytics tool, you can actually measure how effective each wave of training has been for that agent group so that you only need to take those certain agents away for retraining. Um, you know, these, those are just some of the, of, the, of the kind of business touch points, if you like, um, you know, that tell us what a fantastic tool, you know, a limitless tool really, the analytics is. Yeah, the way I almost look at it, you kind of have four key areas you want to get. One is you want to have a perspective of who your customers are. Two is you want to be able to tailor individual interactions. So gaining the insights of what is this customer likely asking about? What do they want to hear? And then whether it is a virtual assistant, whether it's a person, you can communicate that correctly the first time. Then there's the journey design process, which is creating better journeys, whether it's self-service, whether it's agent-led that align with what customers actually expect, what pain points they're trying to avoid. And then finally, there's the operational component, which is elevating agent performance, like you said, improving training, supervisors, metrics, whatever it may be to get you on the right track. I want to wrap up here. I know we're a little over time, but I don't want to leave out Greg because I think he's going to have some great insights to really tie this all together here. 
we preface this by starting with your take on where the market was, Greg, and what are some of the challenges that re- as it relates to technology, as what customers are looking for. I want to summarize by basically saying we've talked about omnichannel. What, in your perspective, does the customer really want from omnichannel? Because, again, I don't really care what our business u- definition really is. Ultimately, we know it's what the customer really wants. So when they interact with your brand in one channel, what do they expect you to happen as they move about the journey? Uh, this is a great question, and I would like to leverage the CX6. is something developed by one of my friends, James Dotkins. They want to have easy, fast, and convenient experiences, easy, reduce the number of steps. And with this solution, it's something that you can do fast, achieve the desired outcome as quick as possible, and convenient through the channel of choice, as we, as we discussed all around this uh, omni-channel. And for companies, it's also important to make these interactions trackable. I know where the customer is. The customer knows where, where he is. They should be personalized and they should predict it. I would like to predict, as, as I already said, what happens in order to avoid any issues. And one point that I want to, to point out out of these six, it's personalized. Because what, what this solution is doing is creating from unstructured data, is creating structured data. And now it's possible to elaborate all this big amount of data and create insights that we can leverage in different ways. Therefore, it's not only about technology, it's about data and leveraging the human beings where it's, where it's needed. Yeah, and I want to close with the personalization point because personalization, I think, has gone through a lot of definition shifts. There's the, you know, having an intimate conversation where you ask, you know, their families and you ask them where they've been on vacation. There's just the popping up the right message at the right time. I'd imagine we probably want to fall somewhere in between, but I want to give you the chance to share what you see as the ultimate idea of per, ideal of personalization right now, as well as also specificity too, because when you're talking with an individual brand, how specific or general should the virtual assistant be? You know, should it be very directly tailored to all the company lingo, all the specific product names, or is it more about just getting them through a core support process? I think it completely depends also from the brand I am interacting. If I'm interacting with an IN brand, I have some expectation. If I am interacting with a super cheap brand, then I have other expectation. That's, that's quite clear. But at the end, I suggest always to start from the successful customer outcome. From a business point of view, what is the successful customer outcome? What want this customer to achieve and what I can offer? And on the other side, as a customer, at the end, if we are speaking about service, I want an effortless experience. I want to have less effort to solve my issue, to get as quick as possible on this solution. I really try to shorten my answer. Think about two different types of experience the experience, from the experience economy, uh, time well spent, time well saved. Independent which experience I want to offer to my customer, I try to design experiences in a different way and then personalize them as expected by the customer. At the end, think about Netflix. You have, if you open your Netflix, let's say 80% is tailored to you. And it's something that nowadays customers are expecting because I'm not comparing the bank with the bank, but I'm comparing the bank with Netflix, with Uber, and all these solutions that are nowadays state of the art. Well, I think that brings us to the end. And it's, I think if we go back to the title of this webinar, the core theme, this develop, uh, deploy once develop Omni, what ultimately is coming up here is this idea that your intelligent virtual assistant, your AI tool, or any investment you make from a technology standpoint, you need to be considering all the ways in which it can, can impact your business. Yes, it'd be great if it's just going to instantly solve every customer's problem and just wow them and they're going to have the time of their life interacting with this automated tool. We know that's not going to be realistic, but what is realistic is something in that conversation is going to be useful to designing a better journey. You're going to find out where it broke down. You're going to find out the language the customer uses to ask a question that you didn't anticipate when you wrote your scripts. You're going to find out what you want to tell your agents so that when they do have live conversations, they do the right thing. It all starts with implementing correctly in the right part of the journey with the right technology and the right mindset, and then success follows. Thanks so much to our speakers here for a tremendous
tremendous webinar. And again, the questions we see that came in, they're going to be thrilled to follow up with you after the fact because they're passionate about it. They're excited to see your passion. That's what customer centricity is all about. So for CCW Digital, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.